All right, let's get started. Just a reminder again, uh, two weeks from today, you've got spring break next week, two weeks from today is the next exam, the second midterm exam. That's going to be on units three and four. Um, if you haven't already, are you okay with the lights down just a little bit? Are we all right with that? If you haven't already, uh, Christine Hartman, who's our TA, has done a video recording and has taken unit three and tried to digest it for you guys. Has anybody taken a look at that? Was it Logan helpful? It's longer. She initially said 15 minutes, but she did a... Yeah, it was kind of helpful. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So her idea is to kind of walk through like a student and, and say, what you know, how can we stitch this, get this together? How can we begin to study? Use that as your preliminary study guide and use the discussion with that that needs to be done. I think I put a deadline for Sunday on that. That's a graded assignment on Canvas. Um, use that as a way to start thinking about these themes and thinking about the exam. Um, any questions about that. Ashton. Um, will you be giving us a study guide for the next exam? Did last time. Will you be giving us a study guide for the next exam? I will, and it probably you probably won't get it until the beginning of the break. Um, this so her video is going to be really a substantial part of that. So use it as that. I think what I'm going to do as well is reduce the number of large questions on the study guide so that the, I think there were too many to try to go after. I guessed from some of the answers that I got on the large questions that some of you said, well, I'll just go after this one because I'm sure this is the one you're going to put on the exam. And then that was the only answer you had for a different question. Um, so rather than set you guys up for something, I think I will reduce that. But yes, I'll give you some stuff to work with. It is never too early. So y'all are college students now. Some of you have been college students more than just this year, but some of you are just getting started. It's on you, really, at this point as well. Like, it's never too early to get started, and if what you're waiting for is guidance on what to do, you're not really approaching your own learning the right way. And I know this is a GE, and I know that you're required to take it, and nobody's going to be a historian, but GEs are where the learning actually happens. Believe it or not, even if you're going to be something else. And so putting your own sort of initiative into that learning, just it serves you well. Um, and so there's never too early to get started on it. I will try to get you those guides as soon as possible, however. Um, so this is our economic lecture for Unit 4. Um, so this is our fourth economic lecture. There are three that preceded this. There will be two that follow this. Um, for this one, if you remember, we're going all the way to 2020, and I'm talking about what I call a military state. For the one, the next economic lecture, which comes on March 25th, it's called Consumerism. It's going to have this as a background, like it's going to be understood that this is already what's happening as a foundation of the economy. We build on top of that. And for the final one, which is about the digital age, um, and that's April 8th, so getting near the end of the semester, it'll just be a short chunk, but it'll assume the consumerism, it'll assume the military state, right? So these. Four, these three lectures are kind of building off each other in the same period of time because, one, I think this foundation is important to know, and two, I think we've built on it to a certain extent. Um, so that's, that's the economic, the kind of the, the theory that's behind what you're going to see in these economic lectures. Um, here we are, so it's a big chunk of time, 1939 to 2020. Really, the war was where the lessons were learned um, that became... The, the world you live in, the world that I was born into, um, et cetera. And I just, again, I wanted to remind us that each one of these themes is a, is a set of ideas about history, focusing on a set of ideas. So for the economic, we're looking at kind, scale, and focus of economic activities and institutions, uh, quality of economic life itself. Did we grow? Did we stagnate? Did we retreat? Um, how did the state participate? And we'll notice the state plays an increasingly bigger role through the 20th century. One of the things we're battling with, in fact, in the beginning of the 21st century is how much should the state be involved in economic life? In the 20th century, we decided an awful lot it should be involved an awful lot 
in economic life and became involved. And then just some of the ideas as well. So these are the, in, the intertwined themes that are informing the economic lecture um, and the eco economic theme itself. And again, war, or rather, military state, the military state itself. So we start really again with World War II. Um, and so this is, a, you've seen this a couple different times. That's the total spending on World War II. That up and down in the middle is World War II itself. The black is the federal revenue. The red is federal spending. Um, you read that against Let's see, which one goes to which one? I believe that one goes to, oh, they're both 20%. Um, so that's telling you what percentage of revenue in the black, what percentage of spending in the red, and then those green lines are telling you whether there's a budget deficit or a budget surplus. World War II was a lesson in economic recovery. Like the New Deal started the lesson, but World War II became the lesson in economic recovery. Uh, what do you see here? What do we see here in government spending after World War II? I want you guys to read this data. Yeah. I say there's a lot more spending than there is revenue. There, at times, mm -hmm. you know, there was a surplus at the turn of the century, in fact. But yeah, more so there's more of a year-to-year -year deficit for sure. What else do we see? Different before World War II than after. Greg, what do you see? I see right after the war, we had a positive, and then right before the war, Right before the big red spike, even in the red giant red spike, we're still way down. We spent almost like double with what we didn't have. Yeah, so it was deficit. The war itself, it wasn't really the New Deal. I mean, the New Deal certainly created this deficit spending, right? A pattern that we see later as well. But there's nothing quite like World War II. So enormous investments of federal money. Um. Didn't it increase after the war because we were giving money to the uh, developing countries to spend money on American goods? Some, but it's a few billion, like in a trillion dollar budget. So some of it is, we're now spending some money overseas, foreign aid. The Marshall Plan was a huge example of that, but we ongoing foreign aid for sure. Before the war and after the war. Nobody's seeing this? Am I the only person who can see the difference between before the war and after the war in terms of government spending? It seems that before the war there was minimal government spending. Yeah, less than 10%, 1%. This is the percentage of GDP, right? So it's saying how big is our economy? What role is the government playing in it? Below 10%, even up into the New Deal, where we slightly go over 10%, right? The greatest spending, other than the war and the, and the Civil War, the biggest spending ever done before the war was the New Deal. And that was far exceeded after the war. The government's spending and the government's role in the economy expanded it expanded a little bit with the New Deal, but it expanded tremendously with the war, and it stayed there, right? It's a 10%, almost as high as 15% at some points. Large shares of the GDP, um, always, let's notice, higher than the New Deal. The New Deal was cheap compared to what we've done in terms of government spending since then. We also notice that federal revenue and expenses stay pretty even through this, right? They're mostly on par. It's not, when does it change? Can you read the bottom? No, probably not from there. <coughs> right about there, 1971, 1972. So there's a marked change in the way in which the federal government is willing to spend its money 
as well. Um, and except for really a brief pause right at the end of the 20th century, federal spending has exceeded federal revenue since about 1971, except for the Clinton administration when the budget was balanced. So deficit spending, the New Deal strategy of deficit spending has been here in the present. We might also divide this into two major periods pivoting on 1971. The first, um, when the budget was in order, when the, when the revenues were in line with spending, there's this period of enormous economic growth that's experienced across American society, like equally across American society. We see a working class that moves into the middle class because of unionized jobs. We see expanding middle class jobs. We see people moving to the suburbs. Economic growth throughout all of this, and really pretty evenly in period one across American society. Um, they both share the same paradigm. Well, first, the second, continued growth. Like, we're going to see the growth line itself, but what we want to know is in this period of time, more money was going to the top. And this is sort of what's been marked in our economies since 1970, is that if you were wealthy in 1970, you're exponentially more wealthy. And the opportunities have reduced at the bottom, right? So we see incre increased growth, mostly concentrated in upper income brackets. Um, both of them have the same new paradigm, though, and this is the paradigm of the 20th century. State intervention. There's going to be a level of state participation in the economy as part of the economy itself, right? This is, in part, the cost of that environmental management state, right? It's partly the cost of that new welfare state, social security, health benefits, old age care, something we're still debating about, but it's mostly the role of the military, or what would become sort of the dominant state enterprise, um, which is being a standing global military at all times. Um, so let's just look at a couple of those first. Now, I, we talked about this already, but this becomes this enormous federal expenditure. Environmental Management State, U.S. Geological Survey, the Bureau of Mines, Bureau of Reclamation, Army Corps of Engineers, Forest Service, Department of Agriculture, National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management. These are all agencies with employees out there working on the land itself. Multiple agencies managing vast stretches of space, some for water power, um, some for employment, some for good agriculture um, out in the West. The environmental management state is managing forests, rivers, dams, agriculture, mines, minerals, a good chunk of federal dollars, maybe 12, maybe 15 percent, is just spent on managing our lands. We're a real estate owner at this point. We're a resource owner at this point. And we took that into the 20th century, and that was costly, and that was expensive, and that was where some of that investment went as well. Um, so about 12 to 15 percent. Another maybe 18 to 20 percent of that spending is going into the Social Security. This is the signing of the act, right? You remember that this was part of the second New Deal. At the end of the 30s, it was the settlement house ideals. Francis Perkins, who was a settlement house worker, brought everything that Jane Addams had learned into the federal government and said, well, there's an obligation there. We need to take care of people most in need. Um, and so how do you do that? How does anybody know how Social Security works? Well, Don't you pay a portion of like every income check into like... Yeah, I remember the first time I got my first check when I was first working and I was like, where'd all my money go? Right, but somewhere it was this thing called FICA. FICA, everybody who pays a check pays it. FICA, federal income, I don't know what the CA stands for. Everyone who contributes can send part of their wage to the federal government. Federal government puts that in a huge savings account and immediately spends that money on people who need it. People who are retired, so they reach a certain age. People who have disabilities, so they have a certain requirement. Blind um, children and Medicare, Medicaid. 
slightly separate chunk that's taken off, but the same basic idea. This huge savings account that you're putting money into now and other people are drawing out at the same time. Um, how do you make something like that work, right? So first of all, you gotta make all the employers do it. So that's partly how the law works. You're not, unless you're self-employed, you're not paying that tax, really. Your employer is paying it and just taking it out of your check. So they kind of don't give you the choice. It's going to go there. And if they don't pull it out, they get fines. Um, and so they also, though, then have to figure out where to put the money. Who gets the money? Who are the beneficiaries? Um, and so when we think about Social Security, it's not just that piece, that number on your check. It's this enormous clerical system. They've got to keep track of every single one of you. That's your social security number. They've got to know when you're working and when you're not working, when your money's coming in. They've got to keep track of that money. And then they've got all these beneficiaries. They've got to keep track of who just retired, who's getting the benefits, who's going to work with this money. This huge bureaucracy emerged very quickly around social security because they were talking about managing 26 million people. So you guys may not be familiar with card catalogs. Anybody ever use a card catalog? I grew up with card catalogs. This is how libraries used to catalog their information. Individual cards with individual names, 26 million. The first director of Social Security said this was the most extensive clerical operation in the history of mankind. Um, tremendous amount of challenge to just keep up with all of this and then calculate benefits and figure out how this is all going to work. In fact, it became so complicated that the federal government said we need a better system for this. And it turned out there was this company in upstate New York in the late 1930s that had been developing a calculating machine. And one of their first contracts was with the federal government in 1937. So IBM, the computer company, got its start solving this problem and just simply calculating the benefits, the benefit rates, and keeping track of Social Security. They used punch cards, an old punch card system, vacuum tubes in the computers. I mean, literally, the computers, about as much computing power as we have on one of these things, filling an entire room. Um, but it's to get the job done, right? We can keep track of them. Here's a technology that jumps in. Federal investment going into this. Federal money made IBM. Got it started. It wasn't just federal money. IBM also has a slightly darker history. At the same time, they took a contract with the Nazis, and they were able to use the same people tracking system to help the Nazis keep track of Jews and other undesirables. Um, so some of IBM's money came from the other side of World War II. Um, to their benefit, however, they also produced the machine that made the Manhattan Project possible, the automatic sequence controlled calculator, um, which in March 1944 did the elaborate calculations that made possible the plutonium bomb, that proved that it was possible itself. Um, and so all the formulas for the bomb trigger that worked in 1945. Um, and so we, we see in this is investment of federal need into technologies, technologies which will trickle back into the economy as well. Um, so Social Security was about a quarter of the budget, more or less, probably a little bit less, about a fifth of the budget. Environmental management, about 12, 15 percent. Um, but the big item was the military component. Um, today it's more than 50 percent of our expenditures. Why military? So Social Security became a law, people agreed. The environmental management state grew up and that, that was just a responsibility. Why the military? Why would the military become the biggest expenditure in the United States? Jen? Any ideas? Give it a shot. You're here to think. Why the military? Why would this be? Because we are giving aid to other people. I don't know. Is that people get excited about giving aid to other people? No. Um, European countries, I mean, their, their military was probably in shambles. I mean, we had to basically defend most of them. Okay, so there was this sense of need, at least initially, right? This fear of Stalin 
in Europe, but the, I mean, the British still had a military. The French put their military back together. And before the war, we weren't spending, even close, we were not spending money on the military. We never had a standing military. I mean, if you put money into it, it shows you're confident that you can, you know, go over and win and do what you need to do. Yeah, there's something about that, something about confidence, I think. Derek? Like, do I show like you're on top of us? Like, okay. Like, show like they're like the alpha and all, and not, and not like your country's going to back down. Yeah, something, I mean, there was certainly something in the American identity that was willing to take on exactly that role. That, yeah, okay, we came in and we beat the Japanese and we beat the Nazis and we're not, in a sense, stepping back. And Americans agreed on that. They agreed that the military was important. They agreed, they still agree to this day, even people who fight over every single other war, that World War II was a good war. There was a right war, that we fought for the right side. There was something really good about what we were able to do in that conflict itself. It was something that everyone could agree on. And it's something we, we, we battled over, we continue to degree, agree on. Um, is it also probably a good idea? Or we no? don't want like another Pearl Harbor where we get taken unexpected. Okay, so we don't want to be caught off guard. Other reasons why it might be a good idea? It makes a lot of business. Yeah, it ends up being ends up being good for business, for sure. Stimulate, I mean, certainly the experience of World War II was, well, that New Deal created a lot of forest jobs and a lot of dam jobs, but it was World War II that got the economy going. That was the investment that mattered. So war had kind of proven itself, right? Um, other reasons why it's a good idea? That's a, do we, why we want a military? Protection. Uh, from? Other countries. Okay, and of what? What are we protecting? The people, the government, all of it. Us, you guys, right? We have a lot of stuff. We have a tremendous material wealth. You don't hold on to tremendous material wealth by letting anybody who can come in take it from you, right? And so the wealthier you get, the greater your need for protection. Exactly that. The greater your need to make sure that the people who are, who are benefiting from that wealth aren't at risk of someone and take, coming and taking it from them. Um, World War II, though, had also been this lesson in economic recovery. It taught planners, it taught people at the top of the government um, that there is something really important um, in what they had undertaken. Um, they had, so if we think back to World War I, the lesson from World War I was don't just create demand. If you just create demand, you're going to create chaos in the economy, you're going to create inflation. And that's what happened during World War I. The government said, we want bullets, we want bombs, we want tanks, we want weapons. And the weapons industry produced them and the prices went up because of the demand and then collapsed after the war. Um, massive inflation, then massive depression. During World War II, men like Kenneth Leith, who had also been a participant in World War I and one of the advisors to Wilson um, at the League of Nations conversations, said, no, we gotta calculate everything. We calculate our need. We create a command economy where we figure out everything. How many guns do we need? How many helmets do we need? How many tanks do we need? But more than just that, what's required to make this material? How much material is needed for all of these tanks? What volume of that material is needed? And do we have it as a nation? And in fact, Leith and a committee of about eight individuals calculated the war needs in 1942, and they said, we don't have enough. We're not there yet. How are we going to do this? We might come up short. We've got a problem on our hands. We're not quite ready for the war at all. Um, but they put together a plan and invested really massive knowledge. Yes? What was that guy's name? Kenneth Leith, L-E-I-T-H. And he was an economic geologist, expert on iron, but an expert on global mining. And this one of these interesting characters who sat at the back of World War I and at World War II and shaped really the mineral economy and nobody knows his name because nobody cares about mining except for me. Um, so 
the massive investment of U.S. intelligence in supply chain knowledge, right? Figuring out where the metals were being produced and how much was being produced. Figuring out where they're being produced and what's left in the ground because the thing about minerals is they're a finite resource. You use them once. Once you pull it out of the ground, it's gone itself. How much do we have, they ask. What don't we have? Are there other potential places to look? Are there places we haven't exploited? The U.S. Geological Survey was out in the mountains cutting trenches looking to see if they could find ore. And they asked the question, where else in the world can we get this stuff? as well. And so the beginning of the global vision for the United States was actually about where are we going to get our minerals, where are we going to get our resources to fight the war itself. Um, Leaf and the others looked at the internal economy and created a careful tracking of materials, understanding the full productive capacity of the nation itself. Where are these metals smelted? What's the volume of material that moves through that smelter? How much copper? How much iron? How much is coming out on the other side? Is there room to grow or has it reached its capacity? How much metal can we produce on a regular basis? It involved getting in, into the metal fabricators as well and understanding what they were up to, making sure. So you think about an airplane, it has tens of thousands of individual parts that are each being manufactured in some different place. How do you get all the right stuff manufactured and then together fabricated and together in the factory itself, right? Command economy, we're going to think about every step of this and control every step of it. Making sure that everything's transported to the right sites um, and across the country this was successful. So it started late because the initial estimate for needs was we don't have enough resources to build everything the military needs, but then it was titrated and once it got going, it started flowing and the dollars started flowing and the economies started flowing. Things were transported to the right manufacturing sites and across the country, tanks and guns and airplanes and munitions were manufactured in a mass production command control effort. Ships, Helmets, trucks, jeeps, these are ships up in the Kaiser shipyard up in, uh, uh, outside of Seattle. Um, so this was about knowledge and control. That's what they learned. You, you get ahead of your economy. You learn what's out there. You know where your raw materials are coming from. You don't just gamble on the fact that they're going to be there the next year. And you know where you have future deficits, right? That was one of the most important things the American command economy figured out was we're running out of metals. And we've got to be careful about how we fight this war and how we think about war in the future. Um, in fact, in 1948, the U.S. Geological Survey, which had been asked in 1942 to assess the entire landscape of American metals finally put out its report and it said, we're on the brink of a disaster. We're running into severe shortages in copper, in iron, and several critical alloys. We are not prepared to move into industrialization, at least not in the way that we had done in the 1920s. And part of why there's a shift to a plastics economy is because of the, of the lowering amounts and the increased costs of metals. Um, so, and more often than not, when we look across the world during the Cold War, more often than not, the places where the United States exerted the most firm, if not violent, influence, really up until today even, were places in the world where critical minerals that we did not possess could be found. Right? Not just metals, but fossil fuels as well. So you're all kind of familiar with the oil fields that we're protecting today. There are also mineral fields, Afghanistan, Vietnam, Korea, etc. Um, and so this, this surveillance state looked out across the whole world as the place from where resources could be drawn for the state itself. Um, another really important lesson of World War II and the economics, economics of World War II was the nature of material flow. So we've seen this picture a couple times. What do most of these items have in common? Metal. Besides being made out of metal, they are all made out of metal. And another common element. Oh. 
are all being mass produced by women in factories? They are all being mass produced by women, and so is everything in World War II. But yeah, that's also similar. But as commodities. No use outside of war. No use outside of war. And even more importantly, how many times are you going to use those bullets? One use. This is a massive economy of disposable items. Massive economy of disposable items. Everything you see there is used once. Is expected just to be used in the war itself. Disposable commodities. Goes against these longer Western ideals about durability and craftsmanship and building things that last. You don't build things that last for war. You build things that get used up right away. And in fact, the D-Day invasion itself was made possible by tens of millions of dollars in ammunition, grenades, and artillery used just once, June 6th, just that day, this unleashing of single-use material. Same thing with Dresden and Tokyo and the dozens of other cities that were firebombed in 1944 and 1945. Not only single-use material, but destroying landscapes that are going to need to be rebuilt as well. Right? Um, consuming hundreds of millions of dollars in single-use bombs in a single year. Um, we can take the most extreme example. We spent two billion dollars in less than four days in 1945. It cost two billion dollars to build those two bombs. Four days, they're gone. We've used them. Used up, right? So the lesson was clear, actually, to these war planners, was that disposable single-use items create tremendous economic flow. Tremendous. If you can get people to use more things, you can get more economy, right? And in fact, we know that more than half of all the metal objects that were transported to Europe stayed behind. We left metal all over Europe and all over the Pacific. Um, what made all of that possible, though, was the political support, was this unified idea that this was something that the nation should do. And we can't underestimate mentality. We can't underestimate political will. Um, we know that people became fonder of the federal government through the New Deal, that FDR's New Deal really kind of turned a warm eye. The federal government's there to help us out. So he opened the door for this. Um, but, but the Japanese united us, no question about it. Bombing us on our shores made us a single entity. Um, because remember, there's absolutely nothing in the American economy on December 8th that wasn't there already on December 6th. There was nothing that wasn't there. There wasn't there a year before or five years before. There was nothing new in the economy. The only thing new was the will of the American people to fight and to get involved in this. And it changed everything. It put everybody onto the resources. So working together on a shared project. Right, so those three things, the, um, oh, I'm gonna forget them. the nature of the material flow, the need for knowledge and control, and the importance of political support and political will. All of this made defense spending an anchor of the national economy going forward it never falls below the New Deal level. New Deal, in fact, looks cheap compared to everything that came next. And often, what's maintained is about a 15 to 20 percent of GDP being spent on the military itself. Um, and this was, in fact, I would say, the lesson of the New Deal. What the New Deal showed was that some participation by the state was necessary to stabilize things. It's a cushion, it's a fallback, it's the place where people can go when there's nothing else in the private economy. And in fact, in the last 30 years, this thing we call the economic draft has existed and proven that to be the case, that people go, back, go into the military, they go into the reserves, they fall back into public jobs that are being provided by this in order to keep the economy stable, keep unemployment from falling too low. 
Um, so this 10% investment, um, really 15 to 20 for the rest of the 20th into the 21st century. The government's going to be a part of economic life. Um, this broad investment in supply chain knowledge, this learning about where the materials were, was a big part of what justified maintaining the bases around the world. Um, a lot of this was about the surveillance of raw materials. It also, so you surveil raw materials, you know that it's there. It also means then you get involved politically in those states where the raw materials that you want are. So surveillance of raw material becomes surveillance of politics and becomes the expression of the Cold War that we know so much. Um, this investment was, so it was an investment broad scale, looking at resources. It was also an investment in people and personnel. Um, and really, up until the second period, it included mostly personnel. You're talking about spending money on soldiers. So it meant military employment and a regular set of standing reserves army in the event of real trouble. Right, so you keep people ready. Um, and it created, and I think uh, Bobby suggested, no, Rafe. Sorry, Rafe, you're Bobby. Um, it, it created that confidence, that idea that we're safe. And so you can grow, you can, you can buy your car, you can live safely in the world if you live in the United States. A sense of confidence that America was going to protect its material wealth and a sense of confidence that Americans would have the materials that they needed to produce. That both those things worked together and gave consumers tremendous confidence to buy and to keep buying. Um, and I think you can say that the military investment has worked. There has not been a repeat of World War II. There hasn't been, right? We haven't been caught off guard. There hasn't been these major invasions. There hasn't been an industrial scale war at all. Um, and so in many ways, the Cold War was, was effective. Um, it meant that the United States was constantly preparing for war. And actually, in a number of times, we would end up going to war. Um, but our work was not about, our work was about holding off World War and, if we remember, containing the expansion of communism. Right? Um, now, this containment policy led to a whole bunch of proxy wars in Africa, in Asia, in South America, wars that were fought by militants who were nationalists, but who were carrying either Soviet rifles or American rifles. Um, it also led to four major long-term wars and one major game of brinkmanship. So we think about the period after World War II as being without wars, um, but in fact, we'll see it was filled with war this whole period of time. One little intelligence thing, um, this is one of the things that's driving American planners crazy. This is iron production in the United States. If, it's, if you can't read this, that's 1950 in their decade. What do you see happening after 1950? Decrease. America, I mean, we were literally, so the, the, the planners in 48 who said we're almost out were right, right? We were running out. We had to get more, and iron is the core of this industrial economy. So this fear of scarcity around iron um, is a large part of what's driving this global concern, iron at the base of this economy. Um, so let's look at military spending again, defense spending. This is absolute spending. Um, those are in billions of dollars, um, so year by year. So defense spending, you can see, was minuscule before World War II. It just really literally didn't seem to exist, except in the World War I episode. And even World War I is tiny compared to everything except the immediate post-war period. Um, and you can see right after the war, it drops only to the World War I spending. Um, from that point forward, we would maintain a standing army and a global presence. That was part of what the United States had become, global. Um, so we see a couple little jumps on this chart. The first one, that's our expenditure for the Korean War. Within five years of the end of World War I, we were back in Korea with a full standing army. 
um, taking back that tiny little Korean peninsula from communist forces. We sent 326,000 American soldiers into Korea. Um, and they experienced three years of fighting up the peninsula, back down the peninsula. The war ended with an armistice. We are still at war. Um, and this was a very expensive war. It cost the United States $30 billion to fight that three-year war. So that's $10 billion a year. That's about $276 billion in today's dollars. And 44,000 Americans died in World War II. I mean, sorry, died in the Korean War. 44,000 deaths for this containment, for this non-war, right? This was not seen as the same thing as World War II. Um, and then, within six years of that, we're back at it, right? We're involved in a new fight. As I mentioned last time, first, just to help out the French. We'll give you some weapons, we'll give you some intelligence, we'll put a few guys on the ground. But by 1963, we have a full military on the ground. And by 1966, young Americans, 18 and older, are being drafted into the fight. Vietnam, 2.7 million Americans fought in Vietnam through the draft. 2.7 million Americans fought, some 9 million served. This was a big war. It was a big deal. Um, between 1959 and 1973, we fought on the ground in the south against insurgent forces, and in the north and in, in uh, Cambodia, we bombed. We bombed Cambodia illegally. Um, it was estimated that some 7 million tons of bombs were dropped on North Vietnam and Cambodia during the course of the war. 7 million tons. That's more than twice the volume of material dropped in the entire World War II. More than twice the amount of bombs in the Pacific Theater and Europe fall in North Vietnam. Oh, what well, qualifies it as a uh, It was in Congress said, we were at war with Vietnam. We were not at war with Cambodia, and you're not allowed to bomb a country that you're not at war with. And the claim was we weren't bombing. Cambodia. Um, so we were there just like in Korea on a UN action. Our, our, our mission was to stop the North Vietnamese. They were stationed in Cambodia and so we went after their bases but there was no sanction for that um, and it was it's still considered to be one of the war crimes um, of the Johnson administration. In fact. Um, so twice as much material on, on, on Vietnam. Um, and then when it was over, we lost anyway, right? 58,000 young men die in Vietnam, so not a large percentage of the fighting force, but still 58,000, almost 60,000 die on the battlefield or from battlefield wounds. Um, and this, this was that point where public opinion started to turn. Right? This is that point where the kind of glow of World War II, which got everybody into Korea and excited about Korea, and everybody into Vietnam and excited about Vietnam, it started to sour. We'd lost the war, it cost enormous amounts of money, we'd done illegal things, we watched it all on TV, we saw the horrors on television, and Americans turned against this idea. Um, and really began to, to kind of chip away at, at the World War II consensus about the military. We want to remember that during this same decade, NASA was building these single-use pieces of equipment as well. Anybody know how much a Saturn V costs? I mean, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen Saturn Vs, which literally blow up on their way into outer space. We know how much it costs. Guesses on how much it costs. Three billion. Huh? Three billion. More. Five billion. Way more. They're almost two hundred billion dollars each. Okay, so the investment in NASA was also an investment in military knowledge, military technology. Right? We're building rockets to get to the moon, but we're building rockets to control rockets. We're building rockets to show we have where without. So there's a whole outside of the military budget expenditure that's also taking place 
during this decade. Um, by the end of this, not only are Americans not interested in war, they're not very interested in outer space either. The second landing on the moon didn't get very much attention from the American public. Um, it was, we were kind of soured on this whole war move. Um, and so military spending, we can see, actually diminished, started to go down after Vietnam um, to about the 1950s level. And then we have a shift in policy, right? And then we have Ronald Reagan come to power. Now, what did Reagan do? Is there a war in the... Is there a bump there? Is there a war in the 1980s? Drugs. <laughs> there was the war on drugs. That, was, that <coughs> wasn't nearly the kind of military investment we're talking about here. Derek. <sighs> what did he do, Logan? Didn't the increased military spending kind of have like a pissing match with the USSR in military budget and help produce them and kind of This was, so this was the Reagan strategy. Let's, let's ramp up our military, right? So he invested in the military again. This was, it was morning in America. It was, we're gonna come back from the doldrums of Vietnam. We're gonna get excited about this country again. And he started investing while well, he put a lot of money into guerrilla forces. There's the Afghan forces who eventually we would be fighting and they'd be blowing up our towers. But for the time being, we were arming them to fight the Soviets. We were arming guerrillas in Central America to fight the Sandinistas. But we were investing in these cool new technologies, these space age technologies. Technologies, bombers that couldn't be seen by radar. He went back to the space program and created a whole new vision for the space program. That is, instead of using up the rockets every time, we'll bring them back. We'll bring them back each time, the shuttle program. Now the booster rockets, they get used up, but we're beginning to see a recycled space vehicle. And so the space program takes off again. Right at the beginning of that, there was an enormous explosion of the Challenger. We lost a teacher. Big event, but he came on and said, we're going to press on with this. Right? All of these sort of bold new programs themselves. He also invested in warheads. And he invested in not more. So on the top, you can see number of warheads. Blue is us. Red is the Soviet Union. Not more warheads, better warheads. We're going to increase the explosive ability and replace the old. So we're not going to increase our number, we're going to increase our explosive ability. But more importantly, and this was the critical turn in the Cold War itself, he invested in Star Wars weapons defense system. The Star Wars was the name that the media gave it. He created a system, or he invested in a system that was going to be able to track incoming missiles and blow them out of the sky. Right? Missile defense system. This changed everything in the nuclear standoff. Why? Because we, they can no longer blow us up. We had at the time. You remember in the mad Mutually assured destruction was mutual. It's no longer mutual. If we can shoot your rockets out of the air, what's to prevent us from sending a rocket to blow you up? And that was the message to the Soviets from Reagan. And Reagan said he would use nuclear weapons. He was caught on the radio a couple times, he joked about it a couple of times, virulently anti-communist. He was one of the guys in Hollywood who outed all the Hollywood communists when communists in Hollywood were getting outed in the early 1940s. He started out as an actor, but he was very much against the communists. And he said, yeah, we'll blow you up if we have to. And then he built a system that made it possible that escaped from mutual assured destruction. And the Soviets' response was to try to overwhelm us with rockets. They said, okay, we're, we're just gonna keep making more weapons. We're gonna make more weapons and more weapons and more weapons so that if you fire at us, you won't be able to shoot them out of the air. That's our only option at this point. Problem was, Soviet economy could not sustain it. And what Reagan essentially did was he drove the Soviets to spend themselves into the ground. And the Soviet Union collapses by 1989. Their effort broke the Soviet economy itself. And the Cold War ended. The Cold War, which had been driving all of this, which, and I'll tell you, I was in college in the 1980s. We were absolutely convinced we were going to die in a nuclear war. The way Reagan was talking, the weapons that were going up, we were scared to death. 
that we were going to die in a nuclear war. Instead, it worked. This crazy guy was right. You could get this standoff to work. The Soviets fell. Capitalism had won. Um, and so there's no risk out in the world anymore. Um, and what we do see is military spending starts to decline. Starts to decline in 90, and it continues to fall throughout the 90s. Looks like it's starting to head down to something, who knows, reasonable. Um, and then, then what happened? 9-11. 9-11. That's right. When terrorists from some of the regions where we have had our military present and influencing things since World War II, turned around and attacked us on our soil. Really the most serious attack on our soil since the Civil War. Um, anybody alive for that? I know we're, we're aging now. Do you remember? Do you remember it? Anybody remember it? Um, beyond the evidence. Yeah, my daughter was one, and she's a freshman in college. So, well, she wasn't one; she was a baby. Um, I was holding her when this happened. Um, but yeah, September 11, 2001. So all of a sudden, we're of one mind again, because there's something about Americans. You attack us; it doesn't matter what we're fighting over. It doesn't matter what we're fighting over, right? and we turn around. Military spending, we'll see, starts to climb again. So the Reagan Cold War dips. We hadn't even got back to the 1970s yet before, boom. All of a sudden, we're involved in two major conflicts. First, 2001, we invade Afghanistan. Why do we invade Afghanistan? Where we are just now signing a peace treaty 20 years later, 19 years later. Why do we invade Afghanistan? You know, Ross? Well, I think, didn't we think um, Al Qaeda was there or like Bin Laden was there? Or yeah, why are we going into Afghanistan? Yeah, I mean, was it for oil? No, this was immediately, literally within weeks of 9 11. So this was oh, a response. Osama bin Laden? Yes. It's our best intelligence told us that Osama bin Laden, who never claimed that he did this, he never claimed that he did this, we claimed that he did this. Um, was in Afghanistan. And so we went into Afghanistan to get Osama bin Laden. When did we get Osama bin Laden? Uh-huh. It was 2011. We get Osama bin Laden. Obama got Osama. We're just getting out of Afghanistan now. So whatever our mission might have been to start with, it, it, we stayed in place. Now, what we see in Afghanistan is a Dick Cheney, um, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, 21st century approach to the military. So they say we go lean, clean. We don't send in hundreds of thousands of troops. We send in tens of thousands of troops. Um, in fact, the Afghan war over 19 years has used 600,000 troops over 19 years. Has only used twice as many troops as Vietnam over eight, the Argo, twice as many troops as Korea over three years. So we're took, using fewer forces. How are we fighting this war? What are we doing? What's changing? Andrew? Computers, technology, weaponry. Yeah, we're sending bombs. We got people sitting behind computers in Tampa, Florida. In Tampa, Florida, flying drones over Afghanistan, right? We've created this technological behemoth Part of the Reagan investment was an investment in technology and technologies which would be there in place of people themselves. So bombing, drone warfare, this, this still goes on. So over 7,000 bombs, 7,500 were dropped last year in Afghanistan. Um, there's been an uptick. That's what, those, that's what that chart shows on the upper right. Um, so 600,000 soldiers. 2,400 deaths, 2,400 deaths, right? So less than 1%, right? Really small death rate as well. But the cost, any guesses on the cost of the war? Trillions? Trillions. $2.4 trillion. Fewer soldiers more technology, more cost, 
right? $2.4 trillion, more money on bombs, more money on munitions. That's disposable dollars that are going in, and less money on soldiers. So 2001, we invade Afghanistan. Um, we had, because of our strategic uh, planning initiative, always planned for two wars. We could fight two wars at once. So by 2003, we're talking about another war, right? We're being told that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction that put us at risk. And there's this enormous publicity campaign. Colin Powell's involved in it, Rumsfeld is involved in it, Cheney's involved in it, and they say, we cannot risk having Saddam Hussein, who we had trained with our CIA to fight Iran back in the 80s. He'd been our ally, just like Osama bin Laden had been our ally and trained by our CIA. We can't risk what he's going to do in his country. Um, they have weapons of mass destruction. And so in March of 2003, just a few days after my son was born, in fact, um, Operation Shock and Awe took place. And we invaded um, Baghdad. We invaded Iraq. Um, and then we fought for nine years. Like, so Cheney and Rumsfeld said, it'll be mopped up within a year. Nine years later, we were still involved in this war. Same strategy though, smaller number of troops. Here, only 170,000 troops rotated through Iraq at any one time, um, and 4,400 deaths. So the Iraqis fought back just a little better than the, um, than the uh, Afghanis. We probably killed a million Iraqis in the process as well. So a lot of deaths in Iraq. Um, a lot of anger as well. Um, so if you do the math, there's been 75 years since the end of World War II. <clears throat> and for 37 and a half of those years, half of the time since World War II, we've been involved either in an armed conflict or a threatened armed conflict, if you include the Reagan years. Like, war has been what this government's been about since World War II, most of the time. Um, and if you notice, with our most recent wars, defense spending is almost at the level of World War II, right? the biggest war we ever fought. Um, through all of this, the United States has become the war maker of the planet. Um, we can just look from 2000 to 2018, that's the annual budget, the annual expenditures on defense itself. All of this, when you think about spending this money back in the, in the early part of this period, that was money that was spent on soldiers. Now this is money that's spent on technology. And so what's grown up since the 1980s is this enormous defense industry. There are contractors, these are just a few of them. There are a couple of dozen major defense contractors who what they do is they build weapon systems. They design weapon systems. They build technologies. Um, and they, they have become some of the biggest producers on the planet. Um, this is a historical look at our role. So the United States has become a net exporter of weapons as well. Um, this goes all the way back to the 1950. Um, you can see the biggest period was in the 70s and the 80s in terms of exporting, but it continues to go on. We arm the world. So we have become kind of the army, military, the central force. And this is just, this is from 2018. It gives you a sense of our defense budget compared to the rest of the world. Like China is the next, the rest of the world combined after all these other countries. Um, the United States far exceeds production in war and keeping war going. It's become really our identity globally. This is how people see us. Um, this is what we've been in many ways globally. This presence is what stirred up uh, Islamicist anger in places. Um, that this, this, this is a military that's gone too far, some of the world thinks as well. Um, so major increases in expenditure itself. Um, but again, this is the percentage of GDP because our economy has grown too. It's never been anywhere near, uh, well, it's been about New Deal, a little bit over 
New Deal spending, right? The federal government paying about a 10 to 15 percent role in the, in the economy. And this was the lesson from the New Deal. This is what stabilizes an industrial economy. Um, and so far, the outcome's been pretty remarkable. Like we have not, so that dip and that up, remember this is the, this is the depression in the New Deal, and really choppy early beginnings with industrial capitalism, but fairly stable growth since then. So it seems to have worked on the economy. Um, now, as I said before, uneven since about 1971, 72, more money going to the top income earners than the bottom, but steady economic growth. <coughs> Steady economic growth, which has meant increased incomes for Americans. Um, and so far, none of the dips that were coming when this mass production engine first got started in the 1920s. The culture itself got caught up in this war. Right? And so there are a couple of, really one sort of important event. This was the kitchen debate. Um, that's Richard Nixon, who was at that point the vice president under Dwight Eisenhower, and Khrushchev, who was the premier of the Soviet Union. They were in Moscow at a, at a world exposition, people showing off the stuff. And he debated with him about who was going to win the Cold War. And this was televised and recorded. You can see it on uh, YouTube if you'd like to. And he said, and this is how Nixon embedded the suburban home in American consumption in the Cold War. Because um, he said to Khrushchev, yeah, you might build better missiles. You might have a better military, but we have a better economy. We're going to grow you out of this war. We are going to have so much stuff. And he pointed to the suburban home. Every single house, every, every American housewife has these products. Every single house lives with this kind of wealth. He said, we're going to have so much stuff. People are going to want to be Americans. They're not going to want to be communists. We're going to win through economic production itself. We're going to make communism irrelevant. Now, meanwhile, back at home, they were telling their suburban homeowners that there's a nuclear war imminent, the Soviet Union was coming, you could die at any time, and it was your responsibility to take up civil defense. And in fact, they enlisted the household, the American household, as the place where American society was going to recover itself in the event that there was a nuclear war. So they talked about what families needed to do for civil defense. They encouraged and they got Americans to answer left and right to build fallout shelters in their backyard in this huge industry in the 50s and the 60s where suburbanites were literally recreating their suburban home in an in a underground bunker that they created in case there was a nuclear war. They could go down there and they could live and come back out when the nuclear stuff had disappeared um, and rebuild American society. And so this was supposed to take place at the household level. Um, and, uh, and consumers were supposed to be a part of it. So we're going to, in the next unit, we're going to pick up this consumer theme from about the 1950s. And we'll see how consumers became the central trope of American life, really up until the present. Um, for example, the day after 9-11, you know what George Bush said Americans should do? Shop. Shop. That's right. Who said that? Chantez. That's right. Shop. Go out and shop. Right? Because that was the economic, that's who we were economically at this point. Um, and so we'll also look at the, the rise of that and how the disposability of military goods, that disposability becomes something that comes into the consumer economy as well as a way of producing demand and producing need. But undoubtedly floating at the top of this consistent military investment starting in the 40s and coming to the present. Um, Military investment and the investment of the welfare state, environment, and environmental management state was this ballooning middle class. Um, was this wealth like Americans had never experienced before across all dimensions? Um, we would see incomes rise for two decades rapidly. They continue to rise to this day. And since the 1950s, Americans have experienced some of the greatest material abundance humans have ever experienced on Earth. 
right? We take it for granted today uh, because we're in a bit of an economic pinch. We are, we are the elites of human history. Every single American, the elites of human history. We have more stuff at our disposal than people ever had in the past. And that economy grew on top of the stability of putting a military out there and continuing to invest in it for 40 or 50 years. Um, quick question, is, is all this warfare necessary? Personally, I think so. Why? Because it establishes the United States as like a power force. Okay, just so like just not to be messed with. Establishes our dominance. There. Say yes and no. Uh, like it establishes our dominance, but like some of the, some of the wars, like we're, like I feel like we're not needed, and we're not like, something we did not need to step into. Okay. So which, like, if you were to say good war, then maybe okay, war is not okay. Like World War II was a good war, but like. So the containment would have been okay to let just let the peninsula fall, Korean Peninsula, let Vietnam. Well, actually, Vietnam we lost, so they did go communist. Um, so not worth it. There, other people you agree? With you. I agree with what you said. It's worth it. Oh, some, some yes, yeah. some no. What What's different between the first period and the second period? What are some of the differences here? So we can. See Say maybe anything but World War II wasn't necessary. Oh, Derek, what's different? Um, the difference like the first and second period is like the first period is like kind of like going up and down, and the second period is kind of like kind of constant almost. Okay, yeah, it is a little more. There's more deficit spending here, but I'm thinking in terms of the investment in war itself. Did war change after 1970? You think about Reagan, Afghan, and Iraq as compared to World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. It changed because in World War II, Vietnam, and Korea, we sent men, we sent soldiers over in massive amounts, and the technology wasn't as it was for the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war. Right. So we weren't sending as many men over. We we're spending more on technology. Yeah, so we're spending more money on something. Like just what he said, I would say, we became more strategic in our strategies. Yeah, fewer people in harm's way, more money into technology. More money into technology means less money into soldiers, it means less harm, but it also means less money going into individual families and more money going into technological systems, in a sense. And so part of what we see in the second period is the emergence of this enormous arms industry that's building new systems and profiting off of it. Those are engineers who have masters and PhDs, right? Those are not working class jobs, low skill jobs, those are extremely high skill jobs. So the investment even in the military, we might notice this in this second period, there's been more investment in larger institutions, in places where there's more money, less investment in a sort of e e equal way across the population itself. And that's something that we're dealing with today, is this massive difference between the bottom and the top. It starts in about 1970, and we see it reflected in our military strategy as well. And our military strategy just reflects some of the other changes that are taking place in society. We're moving away from investing in people and moving towards investing in machines. Who builds the machines? Maybe we can get the machines to build the machines. Too. I mean, and so we see it after 1970 as well, the investment in the labor for those machines increasingly coming from China, Japan, Taiwan, places where low labor costs keep those prices down. So this investment in technology is also concomitantly a disinvestment in people. And so we might say, even though this looks more like the New Deal in terms of deficit spending, the focus of those public dollars are radically different. The focus of those public dollars are on private weapons manufacturers as opposed to public works projects 
and jobs that keep people at work and put money in the American household. Um, nevertheless, believe it or not, it worked. You guys live in the really greatest economy on the planet. The opportunities are greater than anybody has had in history. And over the next few years, you get to figure out where your place in all of that exists. Um, it'll be there. There's nothing that's crashing about it, even though sometimes people have um, uh, predictions of doom. All right, I will see you after spring break. We should have a unit two uh, summary uh, by the end of spring break. And then there is one lecture you have to watch that's going to be online by the end of the break as well. Um, then we'll do the political lecture that Monday and the exam that Wednesday. Please be safe. So take spring break seriously, but be safe. <laughs>